reading from the book of Tobit. I, Tobit, have walked all the days of my life on the paths of truth and righteousness. I performed many charitable works for my kinsmen and my people who had been deported with me to Nineveh in Assyria. On our festival of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, a fine dinner was prepared for me, and I reclined to eat. The table was set for me, and when many different dishes were placed before me, I said to my son Tobiah, my son, go out and try to find a poor man from among our kinsmen exiled here in Nineveh. If he is a sincere worshiper of God, bring him back with you so that he can share this meal with me. Indeed, son, I shall wait for you to come back. Tobiah went out to look for some poor kinsman of ours. When he returned, he exclaimed, Father, I said to him, What is it, son? He answered, Father, one of our people has been murdered. His body lies in the marketplace where he was just strangled. I sprang to my feet, leaving the dinner untouched, and I carried the dead man from the street and put him in one of the rooms so that I might bury him after sunset. Returning to my own quarters, I washed myself and ate my food in sorrow. I was reminded of the oracle pronounced by the prophet Amos against Bethel. All your festivals shall be turned into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. And I wept. Then at sunset, I went out, dug a grave and buried him. The neighbors mocked me saying to one another, he is still not afraid. Once before, he was hunted down for execution because of this very thing. Yet now that he has scarcely escaped, here he is again burying the dead. Verbum Domini. Blessed the man who fears the Lord. Blessed the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his command. His posterity shall be mighty upon the earth. The upright generation shall be blessed. His generosity shall endure forever. Light shines through the darkness for the upright. He is gracious and merciful and just. Well for the man who is gracious and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice, he shall never be moved. The just man shall be in everlasting remembrance. and freed us from our sins by your blood. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Dominus Fobiscus, Lex 
Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marco. Jesus began to speak to the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a wine press, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenant farmers and left on a journey. At the proper time, he sent a servant to the tenants to obtain from them some of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and that one they beat over the head and treated shamefully. He sent yet another whom they killed. So too many others, some they beat, others they killed. He had one other to send, a beloved son. He sent him to them last of all, thinking they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come, put the tenants to death, and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture passage? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done, and it is wonderful in our eyes. They were seeking to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, for they realized that he had addressed the parable to them. So they left him and went away. Verbum Domini. So we want to welcome Father Dean and Father Rock, who are here with us this morning, uh, priests of the Diocese of Homa Thibodeau in Louisiana, and a warm welcome to all of you, the pilgrims that they brought with them. We hope that your days here in Alabama will be a time of blessing and grace. Uh, Although we've never met you before, um, Brother Leo, our Brother Leo uh, is from the Homa Thibodeau area so we know you're already good people. (laughs) You know how to have fun and you have great food. Um, So we're glad that you're here. For the benefit of our uh, viewers and our listeners, today is the anniversary of ordination for Father Miguel and Father Dominic. Uh, Today they celebrate their 13th anniversary uh, in the priesthood. And I'm not a superstitious person, I won't say anything about being the year 13, but let's pray for them extra hard uh, today (laughs) and this year. Um, So we promise them, assure them of our prayers uh, today. Jesus, as we hear in the gospel today, you know, he begins to speak to the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders in parables. And uh, in this parable of the wicked tenants, it it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand what Jesus is saying. He's narrating to the leaders of the people the history of Israel. And he's trying to stress to them that God has been very patient with his wayward people through the ages. And he's giving them really a picture when he talks about this vineyard, uh, building this wall and this tower, He's really speaking of the holy city of Jerusalem, that uh, this the city that would be walled, the holy city, and the tower is to be this image of the temple. But Jesus was very effective in his teaching, uh, in using uh, word pictures, basically. And what we're told by people who have studied how Jesus communicated is that this is one of the most effective ways of communicating. To help someone understand, we tell a story uh, or we give them this image. And it's most, uh, um, it's said from the view of counselors that this is best understood by boys and men. Um, Not that women don't appreciate parables, but women maybe don't need picture stories as much as the guys do, you know? (laughs) 
Um, and don't we all identify? You know, we can identify, even if it's not exact, we know what um, the Lord is telling us. We think about this in, in our own lives, uh, how parents speak to us. This is what God did with his children. He's not speaking uh, down to us, but he's, again, speaking to us at our level so we can understand. When we are in school and trying to understand mathematics and this concept of two plus two, we have a, a young man that works for us and the first children that he had was a set of twin boys. Of course, we all thought it was wonderful. The first baby comes along, it's twins. And it's two little boys who are full of energy. And we think they're adorable. Um, they're challenged to their mother and father. And I remember him sharing with me one time, he said, you know, the boys are getting to the age now that we have to start teaching them. And he was astounded. He said, Father, they just don't know anything, you know. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he thought they came, as did I, he thought they came with just a little bit of something, you know. So, like, you could start talking to them about numbers or about letters and Oh, yes, you know, they'd have some kind of pre program in them. But how simple children are, they look at you like, you know, why does that letter have any significance to me? And you have to start from ground zero. But isn't this what we do with, like I said, in mathematics? Parents are trying to help us understand. And so we have the classic thing, you know, you have two apples you know, and you get two more apples, and how many do you have? Well, that makes sense to a child. All of a sudden they have this picture in their mind. Oh, I understand what you're trying to tell me, and I have four because they can count these physical things. This is what a teacher does, this is what a parent does. Um, my sister, I remember when we were little, this is a story my mother would not often recount as we got older, but we were driving, she was driving when we were small, she was driving our neighbor lady, Helen, uh, to some church event, I believe. Well, as little kids, we didn't like to have this neighbor lady in our car. You know, as children, you want to have your mother all to yourself. And my sister was a little bit more vocal than I was. And so she asked my mother when we were going to drop Helen off. <laughs> when we were going to drop Helen off. You know, when are we going to get her out of the car? And it was trying to be nice, but, you know, it was obvious what this child was saying. And, you know, of course, these two ladies in the front seat just chuckled at these kids. But my mother answered us. I remember she said, well, you know, Helen is my friend. So all of a sudden she spoke to us as little children and that we had friends, and that we weren't interested in dumping our friends out of the car as soon as possible, and we wanted to spend time with them. And so again, a, a big person trying to give us a, 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 a picture in our head that, oh, this is not just this neighbor lady, this is my mommy's friend, and so I can give her space to spend time with her. And the last story I would share with you, um, it's going to put me in great light. That's why I have to tell you. Um, my, I remember reading when I was, I don't know how old I was, but at a point where I was beginning to understand that you're supposed to meditate on the mysteries of the rosary. And you know, as a child, you're taught the prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Marys, the Glory Be. And so you pray these prayers on these beads of the rosary. And then all of a sudden you're reading and it says, you know, well, our Blessed Mother asked us to meditate on these mysteries of the rosary. And I remember being a little bit confused by that. I thought, well, how do you, are, are you supposed to say this Hail Mary? Or are you supposed to meditate on this mystery of Christ's life? You know, how, what, what is it that we're supposed to be doing? And I remember my grandmother saying, well, she's trying to give an example of how you can do two things at once. And I think she could see that my eyebrow was still furrowed, thinking, 
doesn't make any sense. And then she said, you know, when I write a letter, and she gave me the example of writing a letter, she said, when I, when I am writing, I'm not thinking of the exact word that I'm putting down on the piece of paper. She said, I already know what I want to say. And I'm writing this sentence, but I'm already thinking the next sentence that I'm going to write. And she said, and so I'm doing those two things at one time. And that is, uh, I still remind myself of that when I have difficulty praying the rosary, <laughs> praying the Hail Mary and meditating on the mystery. It's like, here, this is what you do. And you know, now even today, it's even more so. You sit down and you're writing an, an email and how our hands are flying across that keyboard. We're not paying attention to every little letter we're striking, every keystroke we make. But our mind is already on what we're trying to communicate and our hands are following along with that. It's a good mental image or good picture of what it means to meditate on the mysteries of the rosary. And so this is what Jesus does. He gives us this word picture, this parable. He tells us a story so we can understand what he's saying to us. Now, his story may not be as sweet as and endearing as the ones I shared with you. His story in this occasion of telling, speaking of the wicked tenants is more like a father telling his son, you know, if you don't get out of bed this morning and get this, your chores done, this is what this may look like, you know, by the end of the day, you know, and we all understand, yes, sir, you know, I'm up and I'm doing the job. And this is what Jesus is doing in this account. He's telling us this is what happened. You know, God is so patient with us. He keeps sending us the prophets. He keeps sending us time and again those to call you. And in the end, he's going to trust that he can send his only son. In this we hear what the father is thinking. I have one more to send. They will respect my son. So this is Jesus really communicating to us what the sentiment of God is. That certainly they're going to respect my son. But he already tells us what will happen. That here they, they look at him. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. You know, it's the contradiction of Christ. That this makes sense on a human level. Let's seize him. He's the son who's going to inherit everything. Let's kill him, and then we can keep the vineyard. We can keep what belongs to him. But in the ways of God, it's quite the opposite. We need to embrace the Son, and then the inheritance will be ours. Now, isn't this what happens in our baptism? That we are made, we inherit the kingdom of heaven. Because of our embracing of Christ, because we embrace the Son of God, we become children of God. And so the Lord is already sticking that to them, trying to get them to understand, don't hate the heir. Don't hate the Son of God and lose everything. Instead, embrace the Son and you'll inherit all that the Lord has to give, all that the Lord has to promise. And Jesus, in telling this uh, parable, makes two predictions. One prediction is that he's going to be cast out of the holy city. He's going to be thrust out of the vineyard and that he will be crucified outside of the walls of the city. And this is what happened. Jesus was taken outside of the holy city of Jerusalem and put to death. Um, and that's what he says. They're going to come and take him. They have seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. They don't want him in the holy city. And then he also is predicting to them that that holy city is going to be destroyed. You know, they, the leaders of the people thought this was going to be impossible. You know, they had the holy temple. So he says, what's going to happen to these owners of the vineyard? The owner is going to come, 
put the tenants to death and give the vineyard to others. And so Jesus is predicting to them the destruction uh, of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD. And that is in fact what happened. The Roman legions destroyed Jerusalem and in essence brought the old covenant to a dramatic and violent end. The temple was destroyed and even the Jewish people today go and pray at a supporting wall of the mount that supported the temple, you know, to have a sense that this was this holy place, but it's been destroyed. And in the destruction of the temple, in the destruction of the holy city, it's God saying, you didn't heed my call. You cast out the air. You rejected him. And so I'm going to come and destroy this city. Saint Bede, in looking at this, he looks at this parable and says, well, we have to apply this to the life of every believer. This doesn't only apply to the chief priests and the elders at the time of Christ, but to each one of us. And so we need to read this in light of the vineyard ultimately being the heart of every believer, our heart. And that we've been uh, given this opportunity to cultivate, and it's our duty to cultivate the life that God has given us in the grace of baptism. And so he sends us the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, the teaching that comes from sacred scripture. And so if we want to foster our life with the Lord and keep alive this, this life that we've received in baptism, we read the sacred scripture. Um, and our hearts are to be turned toward the Lord. And it's not only <clears throat> the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, but most importantly, the gospel. And when we receive the gospel and the gospel is preached to us, we are to receive Christ. The Father is sending the gift of his Son, sharing his Son with us. And we must not despise these servants. So this is what St. Bede is saying. As we read the sacred scripture, we each individually must not despise the servants that God is sending to us. And we must not despise the son, the heir to the kingdom that is being sent to us. Otherwise, we'll forfeit this grace, we'll forfeit this life that's been given to us. So again, I think the challenge for us today, and especially for all of you as you begin this time of retreat, I think to reflect upon these words of the tenants and put them in our own uh, context, as St. Bede would invite us to. The Father says about each of us, certainly they will respect my son. Each of us in our faith desires not only to respect the son, but to love the Son. But when we sin, when we fail, what ultimately we're saying to the Lord or about the Son is, this is the heir. Let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. Let's not fall into that confusion. If we reject the Son and kill him by our sin, by our choosing against him, we lose everything. But as I said earlier, it's in our embracing of the Son. It's that we, uh, again, not only respect him, but love him. And we're made one with him, and in that, we inherit uh, eternal life. 